This is a prairie dog colony in Saskatchewan. All told, thousands of these burrowing rodents live here. And this is home for one prairie dog family. It features living quarters, storage chambers, and peace of mind. The burrow is a safe haven from all the prairie dogs' predators. Except for the one predator that can creep down the burrow at night and strangle them while they sleep. For generations, prairie dogs here have slept more soundly. Because the last time a black-footed ferret hunted in Saskatchewan was almost a century ago, that's about to change. There is a creature so mysterious, few people have ever seen it in the wild. When they do, many fall in love. But don't be fooled. Behind the masked face beats the heart of a prairie bandit. It is a black-footed ferret. Black-footed ferrets are solitary creatures. They can be very secretive, and they're mostly out only at night. It's very difficult to study this species because they live below ground. So you could be standing on a prairie dog colony, and there's ferrets sleeping below you, but you can't find them, and you don't know that they're down there. So just finding these guys can be a, a, a real difficult task. Black-footed ferrets are an endangered species. They were once so rare, they were thought to be extinct. Wildlife biologist Travis Laviri has dedicated his life to saving this creature and returning it to the wild. I feel a duty to black-footed ferrets because as humans, we were one of the causes of their near extinction. And I think we owe it to the species to try and recover them if we can. Travis Laviri takes black-footed ferrets born in zoos and reintroduces them to where they historically lived, the North American prairies. He's played a role in 16 reintroductions throughout the US and Mexico. His next assignment is helping to reintroduce the ferrets to one of the last blocks of native prairie in Canada, Grasslands National Park. Located in the province of Saskatchewan, just above the U.S. border. The last time a ferret was seen here was 1937. I'm very excited about bringing ferrets out here. I'm very excited about following up and seeing if we can actually get a population established in Canada. Over the first 12 months of the reintroduction, Travis will help the park track the progress of the Canadian ferrets. It's autumn, and the day of the black-footed ferrets' reintroduction into Canada has finally arrived. This van contains the precious cargo, 19 females, 15 males, all born in zoos. You can probably guess which ones were born at the Toronto Zoo. Yeah. <laughs> Black-footed ferrets are the only native ferret species to North America. So the pet ferrets that you see out there are actually descended from European ferrets. Black-footed ferrets eat only one thing, 
prairie dogs. Some prairie dog liver. They love liver. Chock full of vitamins, very good moisture. Yeah, that's a good meal. Okay, honey. I'm going to do it like this then. This will be the last catered meal before the ferret's first taste of freedom. Black-footed ferrets evolved into what biologists call specialist predators. That means they specialize in hunting prairie dogs. As a result, the only place they can survive is a prairie dog colony. So we're going to go a little bit, uh, a little bit to the left here. Mind you, we've got Travis, Parks Canada biologist Pat Fargi, and Calgary Zoo researcher Natasha Lloyd are on one of the park's prairie dog colonies. They are marking the spots where the ferrets will be released. Years of research have already been spent determining this habitat can support the ferrets, even with a drought that has taken its toll on the landscape. Well, we walked past it. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. 18 meters. That one or that one, I'll let you choose. Grasslands is the only place in Canada where prairie dogs are now found. And it's in their burrows that the ferrets will find food and shelter. It look, looks like a great home for a blackfoot ferret. A great home indeed. Let me guess, 371 meters to the south. The black-footed ferret's dependency on prairie dogs is a relationship that has served them well in good times but not in bad. Prairie dogs once numbered in the billions, and their colonies spanned the length of North America. The trouble came when European settlers colonized the West. They saw the prairie dogs as pests that ate copious amounts of grass, and dotted the landscape with dangerous holes. The U.S. government sponsored their extermination. Beginning in the early 1900s, it handed out free poison by the bucketful. Combined with the conversion of land to farming and the introduction of new diseases, the end result was the prairie dog's range and population crashed to 2% of what it used to be. Large areas of prairie dogs that existed throughout the grassland started to become fragmented into small island populations. And as they became fragmented into these small islands, black-footed ferret populations got sucked right down into a, a vortex of extinction. And that drew them right down to literally 18 animals in the 1980s. These 18 black-footed ferrets found in Wyoming were the last in the world. Researchers captured them and began breeding them in zoos. By 1991, there were enough young that researchers could start putting the species out in the wild again. We don't have a lot of places left in North America to, to reintroduce black-footed ferrets because we basically need large blocks of prairie dog colonies in order to do that. And we need them in areas that are protected so Grasslands National Park makes an excellent spot to reintroduce black-footed ferrets. Grasslands National Park is an oasis for 16 species at risk, including two that were also reintroduced. The bison and the swift fox. The park occupies almost 900 square kilometers. Scattered around are close to two dozen prairie dog colonies. Ferrets are being released only onto colonies where prairie dog numbers are high enough to support the ferret's needs. She's going to come out this way. Let's all stand back here. Reintroducing nearly extinct species back into the wild is always a gamble. 
it will be no different here. For the ferret will not just be the hunter, it will also be the hunted. <laughs> Black-footed ferrets are what we call a middle-level carnivore and predator. So they eat things, but they also get eaten by other things. So they're on the lookout for coyotes, great horned owls, badgers, bobcats, and even hawks in the early morning can sometimes take a black-footed ferret. Life will be hard for the ferrets, but Travis believes it's worth it. They at least get a chance to experience the freedom they're supposed to have. And some people call it cruel, but I think they deserve that. <laughs> that works really well. Okay. I'm not ready yet. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, way to go, guys. Yeah. Give yourselves a hand. Yay. All ferrets release, returning to our vehicles. The crowd departs, but Travis stays behind. He can find ferrets in total darkness. His powerful spotlight will pick up a reflection from their eyes hundreds of meters away. He zeroes in. The ferret responds with a display Travis has nicknamed the Ferret Happy Dance. No one is sure why ferrets do it. It could be a warning to intruders, or just an act of celebration of newfound freedom, perhaps. Winters in Grasslands National Park are brutal. No one has seen a ferret for three months. Travis Laviri has come back to help find them. I'm very anxious to find some ferrets here, just to, to, to put to rest that sinking feeling in your stomach that something may not have got, gone right here. So just through this swale and then yeah, we go down. Travis and park employee Ashley Ruth are hiking to Grassland's largest prairie dog colony, where six ferrets were released. Um, oh, <laughs> I, I'm a little bit heavier than you are, so. <laughs> He's teaching Ashley how to track ferrets in winter. That's about what ferret tracks should look like in the snow. So okay. we're looking for this pattern going looking from Looking for about that pattern. Burrow to burrow. Exactly. Exactly. Right now we're we're heading into breeding season. The males will fight try to find as many females as they can and breed as many females as possible. To find receptive females, a male might have to cross an entire colony or even travel to another, all the while exposed to predators. But see look at there's almost like a double track here. It's not, not ferret tracks they find. That's coyote. Okay. You can kind of see the, the canine shape there of that, very similar to a dog. Yeah, that looks very coyote-like. Coyote came into here. They retrieve a memory card from a motion-activated camera set up on a burrow where a ferret was released last fall. They hope the photos will produce the first proof that the ferrets are surviving the winter. Okay. The photos start in early November. There's a prairie dog in the daytime. Oh. There. <laughs> That's phenomenal. Yeah. The magpie and the 
the weasel having a small standoff on the prairie. But, oh, there's a badger at the same burrow. There he is. Yeah. All right. And one night later, black-footed ferret using that burrow. Oh, that's a coyote. That is the primary predator of black-footed ferrets. Uh, seeing them that close makes me a little bit nervous to, yeah. to that ferret. So there's obviously he's checking that area out. These are animals that they're gonna have to get used to living with as yeah. part of their natural habitat. The last photo of the ferret is from six weeks ago. Back in the colonies, Travis discovers another danger for the ferrets. Many of the burrows are plugged with ice. Black-tailed prairie dogs this far north do something no others do. They go into short periods of hibernation. And while they sleep, their body heat turns the snow to ice, making the burrow impassable. Bad news for a ferret looking for its next meal or for a quick escape route. The ferret's out fighting for his life, trying to find prairie dogs, yet fighting against badgers and coyotes and other things out here. Travis and park biologist Pat Fargy have spent four nights looking for any sign of the 34 ferrets that were released, but with no success. It's snow. This week has been very difficult in terms of spotlighting at night because of fog rolling in. You can't see 50 feet sometimes. It's some coyote tracks here. Yeah, no, I've seen some earlier too. That's decently fresh, eh? Wandered off. He is relatively fresh, yeah. What I've been most anxious about after spotlighting here for the United States is all the tracks for coyotes and all the sign of badgers that we've seen. Um, we know that there's probably some great horned owls in there also, yet we haven't seen a lot of ferret sign yet. One of the main suspects in the ferret's disappearance is the park's population of owls. We're interested in finding these roosting places near where the ferrets are released because we're a little concerned that uh, the ferrets may be being preyed upon by great horned owls. So what we have here is a tree where a great horned owl likes to sit. And once they've got all the, the meat digested and it's passed through, they form it into a kind of a pellet and regurgitate it back out their mouth. So you look at this one here, this is a pretty good one. It looks like here he was eating a bird. You can see there's some, it looks like matted feathers and some very fine little bones. Before being released, each ferret was implanted with a microchip so they can be ID'd. If the owl has eaten a ferret, the microchip will be detected. And we will scan it and get a reading. This owl uh, clearly hasn't been eating a ferret. It's Travis's last night in the park. Still no sign of the ferrets. Fears that the reintroduction has failed are growing. At least the fog has lifted. The temperature has dropped to minus 15 degrees and the hours tick by. Finally, at 4.15. Ashley and Krista, it's Travis. Got a fair over here. This is the first ferret spotted in over three months. He's cautious, constantly periscoping, but never leaving the safety and warmth of the burrow. He watches the intruders for 20 minutes, then suddenly, he's gone. 
I was getting a little bit worried after the past few nights with fog and then not finding anything. Yeah. It did appear to me to be a male just by the size of his head. Well, I certainly hope there's some females out here. Establishing the ferrets back in Canada will depend on the males finding the females. The reintroduction of the ferrets will be successful only if they breed and produce young. Survival isn't enough. Spring. Last year's drought is over. It's pretty easy for folks to get the majesty and grandeur of mountains and lakes and trees and things like that. But there's just as much going on out here as there is in any other ecosystem in North America. And nowhere more so than the prairie dog colonies. That's because prairie dogs are ecological magnets that attract a menagerie of creatures. Some, like the ferrets, come to eat them while others find the grass always greener on the colony. Still more seek shelter in the burrows these industrious rodents have engineered. It's the prairie's version of a supermarket and a hotel rolled into one. If the ferrets mated, baby ferrets called kits are being born underground. They would be almost naked, blind, and helpless. The ferrets have a new challenge, finding food. This colony should be crawling with litters of prairie dog pups by now. But there's only one to be found. and it's the same throughout the park. This year we have seen lower than average prey dog population numbers, and probably a big part of that is, is just really uh, the natural fluctuations, and it's an expression of the, the dry year we had the year before. Because of last year's drought, many prairie dogs lacked enough fat reserves to survive the harsh winter and reproduce. The timing for a population crash couldn't be worse for the ferrets. A female with kits needs to eat at least one prairie dog per day. If you affect prairie dog production, you're probably gonna affect the number of kits that black-footed ferrets produce. So there might be some cascading effects here from, from a climate sense even that could affect black-footed ferrets and their survival and recovery. So are there enough prairie dogs to keep the ferrets alive? An answer comes at two in the morning. A female. When she's confident the coast is clear, the ferret goes hunting in almost total darkness. Her path may seem random, but she's actually using scent to zero in on her prey. The zigzagging is also a defense tactic. Just like a soldier avoiding a sniper's aim, she's trying to avoid the talons of an owl that could sweep her away. The challenge for them is to avoid being eaten by something while you're trying to kill something as big as you are and eat it. Black-footed ferrets creep down to a prairie dog burrow at night. We think that the ferret kind of nudges the prairie dog on the shoulder to get him to slightly move. And when he does, the ferret clamps his mouth down on his neck. 
and suffocates him. There's a reason why ferrets hunt at night. This is what happens when one takes on a wide awake prairie dog in the full light of day. Grasslands National Park usually turns brown by summer, but not this year. The rains have persisted. Today, only 2% of the prairies remain in its native state. So grasslands is a sanctuary for endangered species and the researchers who study them. Got her. For Jeff Holroyd, the story of the black-footed ferret is a cautionary tale. He studies a creature that also occupies abandoned prairie dog burrows. What's happening to the burrowing owl now parallels what happened to the black-footed ferret in the past. Burrowing owls have been declining in Canada for several decades now. Uh, they're probably less than 5% of what they were even 20 years ago. Population's declining because we've cultivated more than three quarters of the Canadian prairies. By cultivating the, the prairies, we've destroyed the cycles of uh, creatures such as grasshoppers. So grasshopper outbreaks are far fewer. They cover less area, they're less intense, which is good news for the farmer, but bad news for the burring owl who has eight or nine young and needs a super abundant food supply if, if the pair are going to raise those young. But why has the burrowing owl persisted in the wild while the ferret has disappeared? It's because owls have a varied diet and could adapt to the changing food supplies. For ferrets, it took a collapse in only one species, the prairie dog, to seal their fate. Travis has been in the park searching for ferret kits for almost a week. The kits, when they're about maybe 45 days of age, start to come above ground. And so that's their first emergence into life on the prairie, really. The last documented sighting of a black-footed ferret in Saskatchewan was more than 70 years ago. There has never been a documented case of young born here. If Travis finds some in this darkness, it will be historic. If he doesn't, the reintroduction will have failed. Oh, there's some ice shine. There's two of them. Yes. There's one farther to the right. Do you see one on the move? Yep. Yep, and they're gonna come together here in a second. I think. Yep, it's moving across to the one on the right, eventually. I was able to count three kits 
with mom. So I had four heads all up at one point in time. And there's the other one, that's okay. It was just a, a thrilling feeling to find that Blackfoot Fairy Kits are surviving in Canada. The kits move about freely in the dark, thanks to eyes that have evolved to amplify the available light. The kits were certainly in play mode. They were chasing each other, wrestling, tackling, and exploring a little bit also. The goal of the game is to playfully bite each other's neck. It's how they will eventually kill a prairie dog. Mom bites the kits, and the kits bite back. The older they get, the more accurate the bites become. While the neck bite might be an innate reflex, success at hunting requires practice. Mom's detected a prairie dog, but the prairie dog has plugged the burrow. So she starts to dig. Researchers call it trenching. In less than two hours, a ferret can move over 20 kilos of soil. But how did mom, who grew up in captivity, hone her hunting skills? Before her release, she went to ferret boot camp in Colorado. Every captive ferret signed up for the reintroduction must first spend a month at the Ferret Conservation Center, run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Here, the recruits are placed in outdoor pens and exposed to prairie dog burrow systems and live prey. By doing this preconditioning, the chances of a captive ferret surviving in the wild increases threefold. But no amount of preconditioning can save them from the biggest threat black-footed ferrets face today. Something strange has happened at Grasslands National Park in Saskatchewan. On a small, isolated prairie dog colony, in a remote corner of the park, all the prairie dogs have disappeared. The fear is plague. When you hear the word plague, it is that exact disease, bubonic plague, um, the thing that, the disease that killed a quarter of the human population in, in the 1300s. It is a deadly disease that can wipe out prairie dogs and black ferrets in a matter of months. Fleas brought plague to North America more than 100 years ago. And because it is foreign, many species have no resistance. The only weapons against it are dusting insecticide into burrows to kill fleas that spread plague, and immunizing ferrets with a newly developed vaccine. But even so, plague is still the deadliest killer of prairie dogs and ferrets today. Travis and park employee Ashley Ruth have come to the blinked out colony to investigate. Can we stop here for a moment, Ashley? Yeah. They're looking for evidence of plague. If it's here, it could spread to the rest of the park. Yeah, I'm not seeing very much moving out there. I can see a few burrows, but nothing standing near them. Our presence should have elicited a response from prairie dogs. They would have started barking or doing something to alert 
others of our presence. Bug spray will keep fleas off. But even if contracted, plague is easily treated in humans with antibiotics. Prairie dogs are not so fortunate. And so the last time this colony was known to be active was? It was this past fall. And there were some burrows that looked like they had been maintained. Yeah, it's completely collapsed then. Yeah, it has collapsed. It's not just the burrow that has collapsed. The entire prairie dog colony ecosystem has as well. Here, you can see how the vegetation has all grown up. They swab a burrow for fleas. The carbon dioxide in Travis's breath will trick any fleas into thinking the cloth is an animal. I don't see anything on I don't there. see anything either. Well, that still doesn't necessarily rule out plague as a possibility. I can't get over how quiet it is on this colony. It is. It's like a it's ghost so town. Two weeks later, a dead prairie dog is found in another colony. Tests confirm it died of plague. But other prairie dogs still look healthy. So was this an isolated case, or is an outbreak imminent? Travis doesn't want to take any chances. Hesitation sometimes could be the, the death of this population. So I hope that they're gonna be considering using some of the tools that are available to mitigate plagues, such as dusting. But in the absence of an outbreak, park officials are hesitating. How the insecticide will affect the colony's biodiversity is not fully understood. Is dusting worth the risk? Using insecticide affects other other parts of the ecosystem. It, you know, it's insecticide, so it's going to kill insects that live in the burrows. And we, we know that there's many interesting insects, some of them probably quite unique, probably many of them undescribed by science. In the past four years, Tara Stevens, a population ecologist with the Calgary Zoo, has trapped thousands of prairie dogs in the park. She's part of a research project studying their population dynamics and suspects plague may have come to the park before this summer. That's because scientists have discovered it doesn't always occur as an outbreak that kills everything. They found in the States now that plague can be in colonies and not wipe everybody out. So it's still a risk and needs to be taken seriously and, and we need to be vigilant. What are the plans? Any dusting or things like that? I don't like the idea of coming through and, and, and dusting everything. I think that if we're gonna do it, we, because we don't know how much of paradox dynamics are attributed to plague, um, I think that a responsible thing to do would be to, um, to dust portions of colonies and then leave some, colony, some portions of the colonies not dusted. You could easily lose colonies week by week. I just hope the timing of things, what's happened with South Gillespie blinking out, yep. a plague positive prairie dog showing up, and the dip in prairie dog numbers makes me a little bit nervous that something might be going on and we might need to be ready to take action very quickly. We, we really don't know what is happening here, which is why it's exciting to be doing research here because um, there's so many questions and, and so many things to be answered. The decision to use the insecticide is put on hold. The released ferrets have all been vaccinated for plague, but not the kits born in the wild. 
They are at risk and need the vaccine as soon as possible. Three weeks have passed since the confirmation of plague in Grasslands National Park. Staff and volunteers have spent night after night combing the park's prairie dog colonies, looking for ferrets. They're desperate to capture and examine as many as they can find and give the life-saving plague vaccine to the kids. Tired. It's been a long week. We haven't really had any good success in trapping on any of the sites we've been working on. No ferrets, really, even on sites where we thought there should be some. Uh, Matt, how are you doing? Yeah, I got three sets of eyes here. I think they might be our kids. Finally, the team gets a break. The mother and her kits are spotted. This is awesome. <laughs> I can't believe how lucky we are. Oh, there's another one right there. Gosh, you know, three nights of uh, looking before this and not a hint of it. To capture the ferrets, long, narrow traps are placed in the burrows where they popped up. The trap is covered to trick the ferret into thinking the burrow is longer. When the ferret pops up again, a trap door snaps shut behind it. The mother and two of the three kits are caught. They are put in tubes that resemble burrows to help calm them. Then the ferrets are rushed to a mobile vet clinic by biologist Pat Fargie. Okay, uh, Chris, I'll just lay him down right here. Sounds good. The trapped ferrets are anesthetized and examined by veterinarian Chris Dutton from the Toronto Zoo. There's no obvious fleas coming off him at the moment. That sometimes happens when the gas goes the in. gas, yeah, so that's good. All right, there we go. Put that on there. That is the mum, isn't yeah, it? Look yeah, at those definitely. mammary glands there. Yeah. The ferrets are given a physical exam. Both of her upper canines are broken. Both? Wow and she's missing her lower right canine as well. Wow. Other than that, the teeth are gorgeous. Her kits yeah. are examined next. Oh, he's big. <laughs> he's big. 950. <laughs> no! <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> he's a chunky guy. Chunky's very good. There are no signs of malnourishment. In fact, yeah, they pass the exam with flying colors. I mean, they're in great body shape. Nothing there. So we need to microchip. Yeah, gotcha. The kits are now implanted with microchips and given the plague vaccine. Each trapped ferret is marked with ink so they can be distinguished from the untrapped ones. There you go. The ferrets have spent the last few hours waiting for the anesthetic to wear off. Now, they return to their burrow and to the kit that was never caught. There you go. You're good. You're good. There you go. You're free. 30 meters away, the third kit, the one that eluded the traps, pops up and watches. For the first time in her life, she spent the night alone. Now the mother wants to reunite her family. But the kits still feel vulnerable above ground and in the daylight. It takes coaxing and cajoling. Finally, 30 minutes later, 
The first family of kits born in the wild in Canada in 80 years is together again. They grow pretty quickly and usually by late September they start to get independent of their mother and they'll start dispersing. So generally by October, Blackfoot fairy kits will start moving away from their mother and finding their own territories and colonies to live on. This dispersal is the last step in the kit's development into adults. It's been a year since the first reintroduction. Out of the 34 ferrets released, only nine are found alive. Three ferret kits are born in the wild. A second nursing female is caught, but no one has seen her young. They've identified females throughout different portions of the park that have survived, but not all of them were bred. That being said, having reproduction is the benchmark to reach in black river ferret recovery. The seeds have been planted. We need to build upon that here, and I think this will be a successful population. Making it self-sustaining, though, will require releasing more ferrets over the next few years. We're gonna find males to put in with those females that we know were out there that didn't, uh, didn't have a chance to, to breed last year. And we're really hopeful that next year we'll, instead of two litters, we'll have four or five or six. One year after the first release, an additional 15 ferrets are being set free. More than anything, the fate of the ferrets depends on the prairie dogs. There's been no sign of a plague outbreak yet, but the park has decided to start dusting for fleas anyway. By autumn's end, one third of the colonies, or 32,000 burrows, will be treated. Despite all these challenges, the prairie bandit no longer teeters on the brink of extinction. I'm proud to say that they're not the most endangered mammal in North America anymore because we have nearly 1,000 out in the wild and 300 in captivity. So we've done, I think, a tremendous job so far in recovery of the black-footed ferret, but we have a ways to go yet.